Thanks, everyone. Everybody hear me? Excellent. Um, so uh, as you just heard, I'm a computer scientist. I work in the Department of Computing at Goldsmiths. Um, I'm also a musician. I create a lot of software for myself to use, but my jam, I guess, is really creating software for other people and working with a lot of uh, composers, digital media artists, game designers. And I'm going to talk about uh, a lot of that work today. And one of the things that gets me really excited, and I think this applies to a lot of you in the room as well, is that we're just at the perfect moment right now in terms of commercial, commodity, consumer-facing, sensing stuff, right? So probably most of you in here at one point or another have played around with Kinect or Wiimotes or Leaps or the accelerometers in your phone or Arduino or any number of other things that are suddenly affordable, pretty robust, pretty fun, and things that allow you to connect to controlling sound or animation or any number of other things. And uh, personally and professionally, I'm really interested in taking a lot of these devices and saying, well, what can we do with them? What can we as professional musicians build with these that are going to be really musically expressive and evocative and original? What could we do with these, taking them to a group of 12-year-olds and helping them to maybe build something musical and technical in hardware for the very first time? Um, and no matter who's using these things, no matter what kind of music they're going to be trying to make or what kind of art they're trying to make, um, we can think about the systems that people might build as sort of having three components. The first is the sensing, right? Actually getting data about what somebody is doing or the state of the world. Um, the second, which normally happens in the computer or in some sort of, of processor, is that that sensor data has to be interpreted. We have to make sense of that. And then once we know what's going on, what motion the person is doing, for example, um, then we need to produce a response. We could send that data to MaxMSP and make some sound. We could send it to processing and make an animation, we could send it to Unity and control a game. And these are all things that I'm interested in. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, sensing now is pretty easy, at least relatively speaking. Um, and producing a response is also often pretty easy. If you're a Max programmer or you're a processing person, um, these are common things that are taught. There's a little bit of skill that goes into, say, designing a new synthesis patch, but a lot of us are pretty good at that. Uh, but this middle stage of taking that data and interpreting it um, and figuring out what sounds we want to make or what animations we want to create, that can be difficult and annoying, even for people who are really expert programmers. So the way this is typically done, of course, is you write a big pro you know, program code in the language of your choice. You do some signal processing. You have a lot of if statements. And then you, you have to debug it, right? even if you're really good. And of course, if you're a 12-year-old kid who's never programmed, or you're an amazing acoustic musician who's never programmed, you've really, you know, you've got a lot of work to do to even get to the point of this being feasible. So in my work that I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm interested in saying, okay, forget about programming. Programming is great, but it's not always the right tool. Uh, what if instead we start building new instruments, game controllers, other things, from examples of things that people care about, um, examples of movement and sound. So I could say, hey, computer, when I do this, um, I want the computer to recognize that as a closed fist and play you know, some beat. And when I change what I'm doing with my hand, maybe I want it to recognize that as an open hand and play some other music. And I'll show you that in my first demo. Or maybe I want to do something a little bit more complicated and I'm going to move in front of a connect and I want my max patch when I do that to play a sound that's, you know, like me moving sliders on a screen, but a little bit more interesting. Um, so I'll show you a demo of that as well. And the key to making this kind of programming by example work uh, ends up being to use supervised learning, a lot of the same algorithms that are used in a wide array of data mining applications all over the place. Um, if you haven't seen anything about supervised learning before, this is supervised learning in a nutshell. We start with some training data, and if we're building a hand gesture controlled instrument, that might mean you know, me showing a few different hand gestures and giving them labels then we can take an off-the-shelf machine learning algorithm that looks at those examples and then builds a model of the relationship between, say, webcam pixels and those uh, you know, nice drum sounds, for example. Um, and then once we've built this model, we can take it, run it in real time, and have a performer make hand gestures and pipe all of this uh, nice information about what someone's doing, pipe that into Max, pipe it into processing, whatever you want. 
All right, so the tool that I've built to do this is called the Weckinator. Um, it allows you to interactively create and refine these data and these models without programming, without knowing anything else about machine learning, really, other than what I've already told you. So you can create these training examples just by demonstrating in real time. You can have the algorithm build you a model, and you can move around in real time and listen to what it does. And by the way, this is all connected via open sound control, so anything that can send or receive open sound control data, you can plug into here. Um, and then, of course, if you don't like what your model does or you want to make your instrument more complicated, you can go back and change it just by changing, changing the training data rather than reprogramming your system. All right, so let's do a demo. I'm going to get my software running here. Um, this is all open source. It's more or less cross-platform. Uh, the version that I'm showing you here is a pretty old version. It's pretty ugly to look at, but it's more or less robust. So the first thing I'm going to do when I load up Weckinator is tell it what I want to control. In the first demo, I'll show you I'm going to be playing a really simple drum machine that I wrote in Chuck. And uh, once I've done that, I'm going to tell Weckinator what I want to be doing as a performer to control that drum machine. And my first demo, I'm going to use the webcam and do some dancing and hand gestures in front of the webcam. Um, you'll see there's a bunch of feature extractors or types of data that you can use kind of right out of the box. You could use the motion sensor in your laptop. Um, you can use some basic audio features if you want to capture data from a singer. Or, of course, you can send it open sound control messages. So let's start um, with this webcam. I'm going to show you the world's worst computer vision system. Um, you'll see this is a, a pretty awful uh, computer vision system. It, it changes a little bit when I move around. Um, but, you know, you would never want to be a programmer who sat down and looked at this 10 by 10 grid of brightnesses and tried to do anything meaningful with it. Certainly not capture the motions of a dancer or a performer. But the reality is, when we use sensors, maybe not webcams, we'd use something a little bit better, but when we use sensors, we're often faced with tasks that look pretty much like that. There's a lot of data, it's high dimensional, it's noisy, it's a pain to work with. But I'm going to use machine learning, and hopefully it will be OK. So here I'm going to select a pretty standard supervised learning algorithm. And I'm just going to start giving it some data. And hopefully we'll have some sound here. All right. So this is my drum machine playing. And this is what it plays when I say, play sound zero. And I'm going to tell it, play sound zero when I'm standing right here. So I'll give it some examples of me standing right there, just sort of snapshots. And this is sound one. And I'm going to say, play that when I'm not standing there. So I gave it some more examples. And I'm going to build a model from that data. And we'll see if it works. All right, that actually works pretty well. So maybe I want to make my, my drum machine more complicated. And I'm going to add another sound to it. So gave it some examples of my hand. I'll retrain it. And I'll run my model. All right, that actually worked pretty well. So I don't need to debug it at all. I could make it. So that's, that's an example of classification. That's a you know, really basic gesture recognition problem with bad, noisy sensors and a pretty good algorithm. Um, all right, so let me show you another example. Um, here I'm going to use a different synthesis program. Here I'm going to use a max patch which is my favorite max patch in the world. Um, and uh, this max patch is, uh, has a, an object in it called blotar. And blotar is this really obnoxious synthesis patch that's a physical model where if you give it one set of parameters, it acts kind of like a flute. Another set of parameters, it acts like an electric electric guitar. And then you have this whole space of other sounds that are sort of like flute guitar hybrids. And um, I've got nine parameters of the sound that I'm going to control. And I'll give you just a few demos of what sounds you can get out of the blowtar right now. All right, so blowtar has this huge sound palette. And if you're a composer, your first response to this might be, wow, cool, that gives me a lot to work with. And your second response might be, crap, I have this nine-dimensional parameter space that I have to 
work with over time, and I have to find these paths through that space that give me musically meaningful sounds. And then maybe I have to connect that to a bunch of input sensors, so if somebody performing can do this in a sensitive way, and that becomes uh, a little daunting. So what we're going to do is get rid of this webcam thing, and instead I'm going to use this game controller, um, which basically just acts like a six-axis joystick. And uh, I'm going to make an instrument with this to control the blowtar. And here, I don't have uh, discrete parameters. I don't, I'm not trying to classify what gesture I'm doing and give it a label. I'm actually doing, um, applying a regression algorithm. If that doesn't mean anything to you, that's, that's fine. But all right, so let's find some good sounds. Uh, I like that sound. Let's make a, a, a boring standard instrument first, then we'll make it kind of weird. Um, so maybe I want this to control the sound, and I want this to control pitch. So I'll say, well, I want this pitch around here, and I want that pitch up here. So I can give it just those examples, build my model. All right, there's my mini blowtar theremin kind of thing. Um, if I want to do something a little bit more radical, I can find some very different sounds. Maybe, yeah, that one, I like that one a lot. Let's turn that up. All right, so I'm going to put that sound here. And that sound over there. And that sound over there. My, my second instrument in Blotar. Thank you. Um, anyway, you get the idea. I could, you know, I've given this demo many times by now, and I've, I've always made something a little bit different each time, um, and that's part of the fun of it. You can find out different ways of playing Blotar instruments, and a lot of them sound pretty cool. So um, that was my demo. Uh, this software has been around for a while now. Um, I've worked with I don't know, maybe a dozen different composers. It's been used in maybe 30 performances so far. I've worked with kids, worked with uh, recently a few people with learning disabilities, building, you know, using instruments with this tether and a few other interfaces. Um, but I have a couple of videos of people who I feel like really know what they're doing and have made some, some fun stuff. Um, so I'll show those to you. So the first one I'll show you is um, by a composer named Anne Hege, and uh, this is a piece in which all the performers have one of these on the floor in front of them. You can't really see it, but their hands are holding these strings. Just a brief clip, let me get rid of my blowtar here. Um, the second thing I'll show you is, uh, let's see, this is a piece made by an undergraduate student um, who was in the Princeton Laptop Orchestra, and here he's having people hit their computers and using the accelerometer inside the laptop to detect where people are hitting. And the last brief clip I'll show you is one of the more um, unexpected projects that one of my students did with this. This is called Snakeinator. He wanted to make a self-charming snake and, of course, uh, used FM synthesis, the mother of all you know, wacky computer music sounds. Um, so it's an FM synthesis self-charming snake.
right. He, he swears the snake really likes it. I don't know how you tell that. But um, anyway, that's, uh, there are more videos online. So if you're interested, certainly um, you can go to the Weckinator website. Um, it's been used by a few other composers who I'll give a shout out to because they've also done really amazing stuff with it. Um, Dan Truman, a composer at Princeton, has done some uh, great sounding instruments with exactly this piece of hardware and the blotar. Uh, Michelle Nagai, on your right side there, uh, made an instrument out of a piece of tree bark that she found on the side of the road. She picked up an Arduino and a bunch of light sensors, embedded the light sensors in the bark, and made one of the most beautiful instruments I've ever seen. And uh, most recently, Letitia Tsunami has been using this in one of her new instruments, Spring Spire, um, and she's... Uh, doing some amazing work as well. So I'm going to wrap up um, with just an explanation of why I do this as a researcher. I'm really interested in this idea that data could be better than code for building things. Certainly, as you've seen, it's faster and easier than sitting down and writing code, even for someone who is an expert programmer. You can build these really complex relationships between someone's movement and the sound that comes out. Um, and certainly, acoustic instruments are like that, right? There's all sorts of aspects of your motion that affect all sorts of different aspects of the sound in interdependent, nonlinear ways. And that's the, exactly the kind of thing that is really hard to do if you're just writing a program that specifies explicitly what your instrument should sound like. Um, and of course, this allows you as a, an instrument builder or a composer to communicate, sorry, communicate um, aspects of goal, your goals and expression that are really embodied aspects of your expertise. Right? It's not about abstracting everything into mathematical equations, it's about movement and it's about sound. So there's lots of research, there's lots of development and music making still to do. So if you're interested in becoming part of this, I'm in London full time now. You can download the software, let me know what you do with it. Uh, if you're a coder, you can contribute code. And if you're a researcher or want to be a researcher, I'm open to collaborations. We have PhD and postdoc openings at Goldsmiths. I'd love to work with you, uh, whether you're a computer scientist or an artist or something else in between. So thank you very much. Thank you.